It's time to talk about continuum solvation models, or implicit solvent models. And first, let's look at how continuum models go about computing the electrostatic component of the free energy of solvation. So again, just as with explicit solvent modeling, I like to think that there are certain rules associated with the implicit solvent. And the first is that if you really get rid of all your solvent molecules using a continuum dielectric, and that's a bit like doing an equilibrium average in essence. That is, you take away the specific molecules, but you leave behind in space, smeared out in a homogeneous way, the effect that those molecules had. And in this instance, that means you will leave your space characterized by the bulk dielectric constant of the solvent itself. Now the good news is that your solute, the system you're interested in, is no larger than it was when it was in the gas phase. All that's changed is that the dielectric constant of exterior, exterior space has changed. So if you like, I've taken uh, this molecule here that looks like the Zwitter ion of alanine apparently, although with some kind of unusual colors for uh, water molecules. We have these hot pink water molecules. They're so offensive being hot pink that we just get rid of them. And instead, we leave behind a dielectric constant of 78.3 if we're working with water at room temperature. And the alanine Zwitter ion shown here is interacting with that surrounding dielectric. So, consequence, you lose all your solvent structural information. So if you were interested in that, forget it. But if you can afford quantum mechanics for the gas phase, you can also afford quantum mechanics for solution. Moreover, because you're doing quantum mechanics, any polarization in your molecule will arise from first principles as you solve for the wave function in a, in a medium having a different dielectric constant than a vacuum. And so we do that with a so-called self-consistent reaction field, and we'll look at that more in a moment. So there are numerous methods uh, to solve for the polarization energy, this interaction, uh, and the Poisson equation is the classical equation that describes how a continuous or a discrete charge representation interacts with a surrounding dielectric. And the free energy to create a charge distribution in a given potential is given by this equation. And the Poisson equation tells you how to relate the charge distribution to the potential. So this is just classical electrostatics from classical physics. But I want to sort of focus more on the conceptual aspects before talking much about algorithms. So let's imagine that you have a, a solute in a medium. And along this axis, you should always label your axes, but this is an old slide and my label is hard to put on now. Uh, think of this as some kind of strange wave function coordinate. So in the gas phase, the free energy associated just with the electrons and the nuclei has some minimum. So this edge of this coordinate is the gas phase wave function. And it's the optimized wave function. So if I move in this direction, the energy associated with the gas phase part of the free energy goes up. However, now let's think about the case where it's not the gas phase. It's interacting with the surrounding medium. So my gas phase molecule, perhaps it has a decent dipole moment. Maybe it's acetone, just to pick a molecule. And maybe my solvent is water, just to pick a solvent. So there is some polarization energy associated with water orienting itself to favorably solvate the acetone. And in a continuum model, that would appear as a dipole moment, basically, being induced in the surrounding dielectric which opposes the acetone dipole, and you get an opposed dipole favorable interaction. So that would be the polarization energy, this difference, the polarization energy of the undistorted wave function. But if I think about increasing the dipole, so let's say that this axis is getting more and more charge separation across the CO bond. Well, the polarization energy will just keep getting better and better as I separate charge as the surrounding medium just loves that separated charge. However, at the same time that I'm getting a better and better interaction with the medium, I'm also paying a cost, remember, in my gas phase portion, because that's still there in the Hamiltonian. When I move the charge around, there's, I, I pay a cost for the usual terms. It's this new term 
It's this potential interacting with the density, because that's what the expectation value over the wave function is, that is the so-called self-consistent reaction field. So when I add together the red curve and the green curve, I get this blue curve. And at some point, the wave function will stop distorting because any further gain in polarization energy is balanced by at least as much, in fact, it stops when it's exactly as much, increase in the gas phase free energy. And that would define the solvated minimum, so a different wave function. So if acetone has a dipole moment of, I don't know, maybe it's 2.4 to buy. I have no idea what acetone is, but I'll just pick a number. Maybe it polarizes until it hits 3.1 to buy, and then it stops. So it's a different wave function, and it's it changed because there was this reaction field that it was interacting with. So that's a, a notional example, but it's also nice to just see a specific example. And here is one. So this molecule, this uh, dinitrobromoaniline, is readily reduced in the environment. So this would come from a dye, it turns out. You'd actually have a diazo linkage here, and that gets hydrolyzed in groundwater, and you've got this uh, dinitrobromoaniline. And in reducing environments in groundwater, of which there are many, one of the two nitro groups gets reduced, and you get a dianilin. Now, it turns out that's very specific. It doesn't uh, give you sort of a 50-50 mixture. It's regiospecific. It's all this group. And uh, this actually derives from research my own group did a long time ago when EPA asked us to make predictions without telling us the answers ahead of time, so that's nice to lay out there. Uh, and we thought about how you would go about uh, making such a prediction and suggested that mechanistically, maybe what happens is reducing environments, what, what is reduction? It's adding an electron to something. So reducing a nitro to an amine is actually a six electron, six proton process with a, so a whole bunch of uh, reductions. It's that the NEF reaction is the reduction of a nitro to an amine. And we speculated that the chemistry would be driven by the very first electron transfer, the reduction, that wherever that electron was most localized, that's where a protonation would take place and subsequent reduction would take place. So what's shown here, this is just a ball and stick picture of the molecule, what's shown here is the distribution in the gas phase of the radical anion that you would get by adding one electron to this molecule. And what's being mapped on this van der Waals surface by color is the attraction to a positive test charge. So this is a negative molecule, so it certainly attracts positive charge no matter what. But the more red the color, the more attractive it is to positive charge. And the more blue the color, the less. And so what you see is that in the gas phase, at least, the distribution of attractiveness is pretty spread out. If you really had to say, you might say this is a little more attractive, it's a little more yellow than over here. Clearly, bromine isn't a great place to be. But if you dial up the dielectric constant, that is, you let things polarize from gas phase epsilon equal 1 to solvate at epsilon equal 78.3 for water, notice how the electron concentrates its density entirely on one nitro group. And it's this nitro group that actually gets reduced. And so that's a nice example of this polarization effect, the interaction with the reaction field, dragging all the electron density into one position. Why? Because it's so much more favorably solvated when you concentrate the charge. All right, so let's, let's talk about these uh, actual fields that are created. Let me take the simplest case of a, a conducting sphere, which can also be thought of as a monatomic ion. So if I have a sphere, and it's got a radius alpha, and it has a charge Q, then classical physics tells you if it's conducting, all the charge runs onto the surface, because of course it's repelling itself, and it wants to get right to the surface, where it's as spread out as possible. And the charge density in that case will simply be, at every point on the surface, the total charge divided by the net surface area. And so for a sphere of radius alpha, there's 4 pi alpha squared worth of surface area. You can also uh, do the classical kind of freshman physics question of what's the potential associated with that, and the potential outside the sphere is minus Q over epsilon distance to the center of the sphere. So to charge up the sphere, that was the work I had on an earlier slide, I want to compute G. Well, I only have to do a surface integral because that's where all my charge distribution is. So I'll do a surface integral of the charge distribution times the potential, integrated over surface elements. 
And so I'll just plug in for my charge distribution this and my potential this, so here they are. And that's a pretty easy integral to do. Uh, ds gives me a 4 pi alpha squared. That cancels this 4 pi alpha squared, and I'm left with q squared, q times q, divided by epsilon times alpha. And so the free energy of charging that sphere is minus 1 half q squared epsilon over alpha. So I can do that for epsilon equals 1 gas phase, and I can do that for epsilon equals 78.3, for instance. And that, that difference, which is the salvation free energy, gives me this Born equation. So the physicist Max Born worked this out a long time ago. So in, a, in atomic units, it's minus 1 half, 1 minus 1 over epsilon, q squared over alpha. So a few things I, I like to call out, qualitative things. What does this say? It says the salvation free energy increases quadratically with the charge. So a di-anion, for instance, having the same radius as a monoanion would be expected to be salvated four times better. It also says that the salvation free energy is reduced linearly, go, as goes as 1 over alpha, with the radius. So if I double the radius, I have the salvation free energy. And then the last thing to note is the effect of the dielectric. So notice the sort of intuitive, if epsilon is 1, that is the free energy of salvation in the gas phase, well, as it must, you get 1 minus 1, everything goes away. There is no free energy of salvation in the gas phase. The gas phase defines where you start from. One thing I might like to point out is, let's, let's imagine that you have a conducting medium, dielectric constant of infinity. Well, of course, this term would completely go away, and I would just get minus a half times 1 times q squared over alpha. So the free energy of salvation would be minus a half q squared over alpha. Now, let me think about a very nonpolar solvent, so an alkane. And those of you who've uh, looked at dielectric constants may know that Alkanes typically have dielectrics of about 2. Most nonpolar solvents are 2. So what does that mean? Well, I would get 1 minus 1 half. So this term will be a half. In a conductor, it was 1. In the gas phase, it was 0. And in an alkane, it's a half. So the alkane is exactly halfway between the gas phase and a conductor. It's half the salvation free energy of a perfectly conducting medium. So Calling an alkane nonpolar is actually a little rude, some might say. It's halfway to a conductor, after all. So it's certainly less polar than a high dielectric solvent, but still an alkane is wildly different from the gas phase. The other thing I'll finally note is, if you uh, do not want to use atomic units, you want to get some rough feel for this, if you were to take Q as just being normal charge, 1, 2, whatever, and if alpha were to be in angstroms, then it turns out that the pre-factor in front of this to get kcals per mole, which is a convenient uh, energy unit to work in, is 332. So that's a big, big number. So a little bit of charge goes a long way to making a very large salvation free energy. All right, well, what if we're not interested in monatomic ions? Well, an another case that can actually be solved analytically is keep a sphere for your molecule there aren't many spherical molecules, but let's just do physics for a moment. And let's say that that sphere has a dipole moment at its center. So this is now an uncharged species, but it's got charge separation within it. Same sort of analysis, I won't actually do the integral here, gives rise to this expression for the free energy of polarization, or the free energy of salvation, the polarization component. Here's the dielectric constant appearing, and it goes as the square of the dipole moment, just like it used to go as the square of the charge. But now it's much more sensitive to the radius. It goes as alpha cubed. And it gives rise to a Schrodinger equation because a dipole can polarize. So the charge on a system is the charge on a system. It doesn't change. But a dipole moment, when you solve for a wave function, of course, you can get more charge separation within your molecule. So the relevant Schrodinger equation you get is your normal gas phase Hamiltonian. And then here is the salvation free energy, and here's this dipole moment. Well, the dipole moment's a function of the wave function, right? So you get a very nonlinear Schrodinger equation because your operator actually depends on the wave function itself. So here's mu times expectation value mu, that's the mu squared. Uh, and in order to variationally minimize that, you have to do a so-called self-consistent reaction field calculation. 
So just as the FOC operator, when we do Hartree FOC calculations, is self-consistent because you need to know the electron density, but you get the electron density from the molecular orbitals. So first you make a guess, and then you keep updating to convergence. Well, it's very similar here, is that you have to keep updating until you are fully converged in the reaction field as well. Okay, another rule for uh, implicit solvent modeling. Well, a continuum dielectric really is a fiction, right? I mean, it's, it's not realistic to think that there are not real molecules out there doing interesting things. So it's best not to get too caught up in theoretical rigor. Occasionally you'll see papers in the literature arguing about what's the best way to compute the electrostatics. So you can argue about that in, in sort of a practical way, but if you claim that you have a more correct answer, that's not really a valid argument because it's not a physical observable in the first place. Nevertheless, because it's not a physical observable and because you can argue about these things, there are now many different methods out there for deciding what the cavity looks like that separates the dielectric from your solute, for solving or approximating the Poisson equation to get the uh, potential that you need in your operator, and they might vary quite a bit from one model to the next. So that's, that's parameterization in some sense, and it's certainly just as important as force field models, although it's often swept under the rug, stealth parameterization, you claim you're invoking some sort of physical constants of the universe instead of actually optimizing anything. But let, let's talk a moment about cavities and how they're filled with charge distributions. So ideal cavities, we talked so far about spheres, turns out that if you do spheres or ellipsoids, you actually can analytically solve the Poisson equation when your charge distribution is expressed on the inside as a multiple expansion. And so I already showed you charge in a sphere, that gives you the Born equation for the polarization free energy. And I showed you the kirkwood onsager result, which is for a dipole in a sphere. But it turns out you can completely generalize this and consider all the multiple moments of your solute, so here's multiple moments of solute, and all the multiple moments that are induced in the solvent as a result of the solute, and then there will be some coupling factors between them, much as in the kirkwood onsager you can think of this thing as being a coupling factor in between mu times mu. So you can uh, work those out analytically, and of course, the higher and higher you go with multiples, the more you're uh, providing a detailed description of charge variation within this ideal cavity. However, ideal cavities, they're just not very realistic for your average arbitrarily shaped molecule. And so if we go to arbitrary cavities instead, well, you can no longer use an analytic solution to the Poisson equation. So either you stick with the Poisson equation and you solve it numerically, or you approximate the Poisson equation, because remember, it's, it's continuum dielectric, it's a fiction, so maybe you've got an approximation that's computationally convenient and close enough to be effective. Uh, the interior charge can be expressed either as a continuous charge distribution, so that's the full electron density you'd get from quantum mechanics, or you can do single or multi-center multiple expansions. So a, a multi-center expansion might be, for instance, little partial charges on all the atoms. So it's all the atoms, so that makes it multi-center. Not very many multiples because it's just charges, but you can go beyond that if you'd like to. Or you can take a single center, maybe the center of mass, and express your charge distribution with a multiple expansion. You can integrate through the volume to measure the interaction of charge with potential. You can use Green's theorem to turn a volume integral into a surface integral. You can approximate the Poisson equation, as I mentioned before. So lots of different ways to do this. Some of the most popular ones out there are the so-called polarized continuum model. In very early days, it was called MST for Mirtus, Scrocco, and Tomasi, and uh, pioneered by Jacopo Tomasi at Pisa, who's retired now, many co-workers. The conductor-like screening model has a, a similar mathematical form to PCM and is also quite popular. The multiple expansion was explored by Jean-Louis Rivai originally and many co-workers and continues to be available out there. And then finally, generalized Born approaches 
uh, first used by Clark Still in the uh, in sort of a force field representation, and later uh, I and Don Trular here at the University of Minnesota have uh, explored these in quantum mechanical models. And generalized Born adopts a generalization of the Born equation where the polarization free energy, it still has this prefactor that you see in the normal Born equation, but instead of having a Q squared on a single atom, it's Q times Q over different atoms, and this gamma has units of one over distance, just as in the classic Born equation, you've got one over a radius. This is now one over uh, some distance. And that gamma is chosen so that it has the right sort of limits that you would expect, either for the case where k equals k prime, so that's the same atom, you ought to get the Born equation, so here's q squared, so you'd like gamma k equal to k prime to be 1 over alpha. And if we look at this expression, let's see, r, that's the distance between k and k prime, that's 0, so that's 0 squared, e to the minus 0 is 1, and here's alpha times alpha, so alpha squared to the minus one-half power, sure enough, that's one over alpha, so that's the right behavior. And then when two species are very, very far apart from one another, you should just get Coulomb's law. Gamma should be one over R. So it'd be the difference in interaction between these two charges as a function of having a dielectric there or not. And so if we look at this again, we see at very, very large distance, I'll get E to minus a huge number, so this goes to zero. All I'm left with is R squared to the minus one-half would give me one over R. Sure enough, that's the right distance again. And so this, this gamma just stitches together those in a way that's been documented to be effective. So this is a, just a sort of recapitulation of what I mentioned there. In a generalized Born model, we take explicit solvent, we make a continuum dielectric, and we do need these little partial charges here on the atoms. Where do they come from? They come from collapsing the continuous density Somehow, you have to pick some model to assign charges to atoms, and then you put those atoms in the dielectric, and you compute the, the polarization free energy, the component of the electrostatic uh, solvation free energy. So a, a nice feature of generalized Born is there's no such thing as charge penetration. Uh, so charge penetration is a phenomenon in polarized continuum models where you're looking at the whole wave function. Well, some of the wave functions out here, it, you know, it goes out to infinity, it exponentially dies off. Generalized Born doesn't suffer from that, so that's uh, nice. It can actually be cast in a perfectly pairwise form, and that can uh, be kind of speedy. But you do need these partial atomic charges, so that can be a disadvantage if you don't have a great way to get at those. It's actually very heavily used in classical simulations because partial charges come as part of a, a, a force field expression. All right, well, that covers the basics of electrostatics for continuum solvent models. In the next video, I want to take a look at the non-electrostatic component because we certainly want to do at least as well as on that as we do on the electrostatics in order to compute full free energies of salvation.